Welcome to the Global Sustainability Leaders Program, hosted by the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce, International Sustainable Chamber of Commerce, and Climate Counts. My name is Michelle Thatcher, and I will be your host for today's podcast as we go beyond the basics of sustainable transportation and take a closer look at three major innovations, electrification, pooling, and automation with Dr. Daniel Sperling, one of the world's foremost leading experts. Dr. Sperling is Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science and Policy and Founding Director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at University of California, Davis. He holds the transportation seat on the California Air Resources Board and served as chair of the Transportation Research, Research Board of the National Academies in 2015 to 16. Among his many awards is the 2013 Blue Planet Prize from the Asahi Glass Foundation for, quote, being a pioneer in opening up new fields of study to create a more efficient, low carbon, and environmentally friendly beneficial transportation systems. He served twice as leading author for the IPCC, sharing the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Sperling has testified seven times to the US Congress and provided 20 keynote presentations in the past year alone. He has authored or co-authored over 250 technical papers and 13 books, including Three Revolutions, Steering Automated, Shared, and Electric Vehicles to a Better Future, which is published by Island Press this just this year. He is widely cited in leading newspapers, been interviewed many times on NPR radio, including Science Talk Friday, Talk of the Nation, and Fresh Air. And in 2009, he was featured on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Welcome to our program, Dr. Sperling. It is such an honor having you with us. And if you can, please share with us why you identified EVs, AV, and pooling as the key components in our mobility transformation. Well, <clears throat> thank you. It's a pleasure to join you and to help spread the word on what's happening in transportation because this is a transformational time. We've seen so little innovation in the transportation sector for half a century. We've, our roads are basically the same, our cars are functionally the same, our transit is functionally the same. So now, all of a sudden, after 50 years of almost no systems innovation in the passenger transportation sector, all of a sudden we're seeing all of this innovation that has the potential to be truly transformational and in some cases is already beginning. So those are, so what I'm really talking about is stuff that's already happening or on the cusp of happening and are so important. So that's the electrification of vehicles and almost certainly our light duty vehicles, our cars and light trucks are going to be electric uh, in the not so far off future, almost totally. Uh, but also electrification, increasingly electrification of larger vehicles is, is becoming more plausible as battery costs come down, as hydrogen fuel cells become more commercially available. And so electrification is definitely going to happen. There's no, there's no question about that. The automation, again, same story. It's definitely going to happen. There's already a lot of, electri uh, a lot of automation technology in our vehicles. We have adaptive cruise control that adjusts the speed and braking. So in following another vehicle, we have lane keeping assistance. We have emergency braking. All of that are the, are the cornerstones or the building blocks of an automated vehicle. So that's going to happen. And that, again, is a question of time, not if. So electric vehicles have been around for so many years. How and why is that component part of the revolution? And, and can you share how the electric vehicles may be, you know, what may be new or surprising to our listeners? 
well, electric vehicles have been around a long time. They were a leading contender to be the main propulsion technology for vehicles in 1900, over 120 years ago. But um, the main problem was batteries. And the batteries were bulky, expensive. And the biggest change that's happened is battery costs have come down. While at the same time, there's increased focus on reducing local air pollution and reducing greenhouse gases. And so you put it all together and it becomes a package that's, that's just so compelling. Every, every car company is, already has all the, has the technology, has the supply chains. Um, they're really ready to go in a major way. They're waiting basically for consumers to buy them and policymakers to increase the uh, regulations or incentives for them to supply the vehicles. And what role is policy playing in, in both the automation and the electrification at this point? Well, you know, it, they're playing big roles, but opposite roles. In terms of electrification, it's pulling the electrification into the marketplace with incentives to consumers, with regulations on the motor, ve on the motor vehicle industry. On the automation side, it's actually slowing it down. Uh, so it's working in the opposite direction, and that is mostly for safety reasons that it's slowing it down. There's concern. There's been a number of fatalities from uh, automated vehicles recently. There was one in Arizona with an Uber car, and then there's always a lot of scrutiny of Tesla, which has a kind of a semi-automated vehicles, the autopilot technology that you can get on their vehicles. And so they've, there's been a couple of fatalities there too. So there's some concerns about safety, but it, you know, all of that, you put it together and it's the third revolution that really could prove really pivotal here. And that's what I call pooling or some people call sharing. And that's because if we let the automation technology revolution just go on in a normal way, which means just that people we just superimpose automated cars right on top of the current uh, usage patterns and current system, meaning that instead of just having our normal car out in the garage, we have an automated car in the garage. And if that happens, if we just have a one-to-one -one, uh, conversion uh, translation like that, the result will be people will drive a lot more or people will be driven a lot more. In other words, there'll be a lot more vehicle use uh, for a long time, just because if you're sitting in a car and you don't have to pay attention, you can eat, you can sleep, you can text, you can watch movies, uh, you can use as your office, use as a hotel room. People are going to commute longer distances, and there's not only going to be more vehicle use with people in them, there'll be vehicle use with people not even in them, because imagine you're in an, at a meeting and you're not sure when it's going to end and you don't want to pay for parking. So you just have the vehicle circle around until you're ready. And you can just start imagining all kinds of scenarios like that. And so all of the, re we've been doing a lot of research on this at UC Davis and, and we just see something like a 50 to 100% increase in vehicle use if everyone just switched to automated vehicles. Well, and I know so, that pool sharing, and, and I, I'm glad, I like, I love that word because, um, you know, I, I used to drive down the freeways and, and always would be able to go into the carpool lane because I would take the extra steps to be able to do that. But I know that the pool sharing as a whole hasn't evolved in a positive way. Um, and I know I've personally seen all those HOV lanes disappear over time and read that, you know, as you have shared that over the past 20 years or 20 years ago, ride sharing accounted for 20% of the commute trips, which is now down to 10%. So uh, share, share with us, how can pooling be part of this new revolution on mobility if it's going downhill? Well, because carpooling today is very inconvenient. And it's like very difficult to organize it. Um, and so what happened now, what Uber and Lyft have done is bring in a whole new approach to how, how we do rides. Now we just press a button, a vehicle comes to us, 
wherever we are, <clears throat> picks us up, takes where we gotta want to go. We don't have to deal with money. Uh, it's all done in the in the back room. And so what we're talking about is making it much, much easier. And what we're talking about is when we call, compare, combine pooling and automation, now we're also greatly reducing the cost of travel. If you think about it, Uber and Lyft, about 75% of their total cost is for the driver. That just disappears. And so the cost of, a, cost of a, ride, a pooled ride in these automated cars will be a, fr a fraction of what it costs to drive your own car today and in an even smaller fraction of what it costs for Uber or Lyft. So it's going to be so cheap and it's going to be so available that um, we hope people we become, uh, you know, won't be able to resist it. And I say we hope, I'm an academic, so we're, I'm studying, you know, I'm independent, you know, I'm uh, impartial to, you know, the politics and everything that plays out in this. But the reality is, if we truly want a sustainable transportation system, this is by far the best opportunity. If you have pooled automated electric cars, the environmental impact is much less, it's accessibility for Everyone, low-income people will have much better access because it'll be cheap. Uh, the people that are physically disadvantaged, they can use it, mobility disadvantaged, they can use it much more easily, they can get around much more easily. And you're using less, you don't need all the parking space, so now you open up a lot of land in our urban areas. It's just across the board, it's economically, environmentally, and socially a far superior transportation system than what we have now. So that's why I say hopefully, because this is our best hope. And you mentioned parking spaces. There was some statistic on California and how much land is attributed to parking just in, uh, maybe it's Los Angeles. What is that, what is that figure again? And, and what is the average per city? How much land would really be opening up? It was Los Angeles, and about 14% of the land in Los Angeles is for parking. Parking at your house, parking on cur along curb, you know, along the curbs, parking at workplaces. It turns out there's three to five parking spaces for every car. And that, you just think about it, you park at home, you park at work, you park at shopping mall. And so what we're doing, I don't know what the numbers, those numbers haven't been calculated for a lot of cities. Um, but I think that's probably pretty typical uh, for the I U.S. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And for the for the average business owner, what do they need to know about these revolutions that will will really affect their profits or their employees and even their business practices as a whole? Well, it's going to be very disruptive, and it's hard to predict all the disruptions that are going to happen just because this could be so transformational. But the first one we've seen already is taxis. Half of, there's half as many taxi rides now as there were six years ago. I mean, that's, that's incredibly fast for a, a transition like that to take place. Taxi companies are going bankrupt uh, everywhere. Um, so that's the first big one. You know, there's going to be disruptions to transit. There's disruptions to the automobile industry. So maybe look at the automobile industry because the automobile industry is much more than just General Motors, Toyota, and so on. It's all of the aftermarket suppliers. It's all the maintenance. It's all the service. It's all the dealerships. All of that is going to be changed. Every major car company now is looking at how do they transition from being a builder of vehicles to a service provider? In other words, how can they be providing these services that we're talking about? So even the big car companies are, get, are very nervous about what's going to happen, but that's going to, you know, the, the shock waves are going to go all through the economy in so many ways. Uh, you can um, start thinking about, you know, I'm talking about the passenger side on the freight side, there's also going to be disruption. It's a little more difficult there to figure out exactly how that's going to play out. It's a little clearer on the passenger side. On the freight side, though, we're going to, you know, certainly a lot of local delivery is, is likely to be automated by vehicles. 
you know, in warehouses and distribution centers, there's going to be more, autom more automation. In the big truck, long haul trucks, it'll take a while, I think, for those to be completely automated, but a lot of this technology will go in so that truck drivers, will, it'll be much easier to drive trucks. And so, you know, that means they might be able to drive longer, which will affect a lot of the uh, logistics systems that exist in, in our metropolitan areas and inter, inner city areas. So it's, I mean, it's just start using your imagination and, and it boggles the mind how this is going to play out. Well, speaking of imagination, give us a scenario. I mean, if we, and, and a time estimate. So say I, you know, what would be a, what would be a possible future scenario if I lived in a somewhat urban or suburban area and I was, you know, tra traveling to work, how might I be getting to work then? Um, what are the, you know, what automation might be taking place? What you know, electrification, um, pooling, you know, how, how did you see those all intersect and just provide, provide a typical way that they might all uh, come together and how, you know, for uh, step by step of how I could get to work. Okay, so there are some companies getting ready to start selling these in a, within a few years. I visited two of them in San Francisco just last week, and General Motors is actually setting up a factory to start building them. Uh, Waymo, which is Google, is buying 60,000 minivans from uh, Fiat Chrysler. Um, so there's, it's, it potentially could happen fast. As I said earlier, I think the regulators and policymakers are going to slow it down. But the first market, the first place it's going to happen, most likely in any significant way, is with Lyft and Uber type services. Because as I said earlier, the benefit, the cost benefits of replacing the driver are so huge that they, they are just drooling to get their hands on some of these vehicles. And what they'll do though is, these vehicles will, uh, it's gonna take a while before we're going to trust these vehicles not to have anyone in it. So I think the way it's gonna play out is these vehicles will operate in some relatively small area in a city or a suburb. Uh, you know, Arizona has, has been trying to promote them and there's a number of places, San Francisco, California. So there'll be a, what we call a geofenced area, an area in which these vehicles can operate automatic uh, under automation they'll they'll go and they'll map that so they know where every fire hydrant is every curve is you know before they really let these vehicles loose so we'll see them the first major application is going to be in these kinds of uber lyft type services uh, and they'll be they probably won't be for long commutes it'll be more like for short trips around some area over time uh, they will they'll extend those boundaries out you know, further and further. And over time also people will uh, be able to buy them. You can buy now uh, vehicles that are nearly automated like the Tesla and Cadillac and Audi and Mercedes and they will go on a freeway. You could sort of trust it on a freeway. I have one, so I know you can't completely trust them. But yeah. Thank I you. I have a I have a neighbor, a 25 year old kid who has a rich parents gave him one of these. Uh -huh. He was on an interstate going down California I five. He said he fell asleep for 15 minutes <gasps> while it was driving, and he lived to tell about it. Bad idea, not yeah. recommended for anyone. <laughs> yeah, I was I was in a uh, one of the the partially automated Teslas just the other day, and. Um, and sure enough, yeah, I wasn't driving, I wasn't driving it, um, but the owner was driving it and she knew, she knew exactly where it didn't work. And one of the areas that it did not work was on a roundabout. It didn't know to go around the roundabout. And so she said, I actually have, to, and she, but she knew that because she drove the road all the time. Other than that, she pretty much was hands off <laughs> and let the car do its thing. But um, but yeah, the roundabout was definitely one of the one of the glitches that just didn't recognize it. So she would have gone crashing into into the uh, uh, curbside at that point. Um, so with 
automation, I, I read that we could be looking at 15 cents a mile. How, how, how do we get to those types of ratios? That's something really exciting to hear about. So if you own, own a car now, the average car costs about, a uh, new car costs about 50, 55 cents a mile to own and operate. And so when you get it, when it gets automated, it'll cost a little bit more, say 60 cents a mile. But then if you use it in this uh, mobility service application, it means it's running 100,000 miles a year, basically, you know, 12, 15, 18 hours a day. Whereas when we own it, we only drive it for one hour a day. So a, our car sits empty 95% of the time. So what we're doing is instead of 95%, we're going to up that to 50 or 70% of the time or 80% of the time. So you spread out those costs over a lot more miles and a lot shorter amount of time. You make them electric and an electric vehicle really thrives when, uh, it, you know, when it's used a lot because the operating costs and the maintenance costs are so low, mm. including energy. So then, and then you have it, and then you have no driver, and then you have it shared. And so I have multiple people in the car, so you're spreading out the costs over two or three or four people. And so that's how you get it down to 15, 20 cents a passenger, uh, passenger mile. And I would note just as a, you know, another contrast. So Uber and Lyft is, you know, maybe it varies quite a bit, but a dollar and a half a mile, a mass transit, Average cost, full cost of own, of running it is about a dollar twenty-five a mile, passenger mm -hmm. mile. You know, we only pay about twenty-five cents a mile as passengers because it's heavily subsidized. But that just gives you a sense of this really, the, just on the cost side itself, could be transformational. And how we we were talking a little bit about land um, and you know, driving a little bit further out, what role does transit and land use, um, what, what's the role of transit and land use? And if everybody has the automated vehicles, which would lead to land use sprawl, I mean, would that lead to more sprawl perhaps? And even with the ride sharing, if it's cheaper, do we tend to, to build out even more to, and not be use, using utilizing that public transportation. So, how did those, um, you know, come into play with each other? And and I know that there might even be a haves or have not scenario within that. All very good questions. So, the, to begin with, transit. So, transit, conventional transit, is really is the best way of moving large numbers of people from one point to another. So if you've got a very dense area or a dense corridor, you want to use rail and bus. But that's but they're not once you get away from that, they're not very efficient. And so what we would like to see in the future, what would be the most efficient is where these other services, they fill out those areas like suburban areas where it's not so dense and they provide feeder access to the transit the main transit route. So let have the main transit pull back to do what it does best and then have all these other services provide access and egress and fill in the gaps. Um, that would be, you know, that would be the most efficient way to do it. And um, what was the other question you asked about? Um, the haves or have nots. Oh, yeah. So, well, the reality is transit provides, only serves about 1% of passenger miles in our country. So, you know, we like to think it serves the low income well, but that's not true. It serves a few low income people in a few places well. So what we, what we have here is the opportunity to provide much better service to many more people because, you know, it'll be inexpensive and, and we can even subsidize it a little instead of spending all that money on on those routes running through trend, through suburban areas and low density areas, take the, you know, we're spending $20 a passenger often on these trips, low density mm -hmm. trips, take that $20 and you can spread it out over five or six people and give them uh, even better service than they were getting. And so there's opportunity for, 
from a social equity perspective, from an accessibility perspective, to do to do it much much better. We've created this car centric uh, transportation system, car centric cities, which really marginalizes a, a large number of people. So this is a way to re-engage and serve uh, the you know almost the entire population. And one final question: What can each of us do to accelerate towards the three revolutions? Okay, so what we need to, so there's a, a, multiple answers to that. One is that in the local government, the local governments, our cities are gonna play a major role in this transition because that's where a lot of these decisions are gonna be made about where these vehicles operate, how they operate, what these services, and whether we encourage the pooling or whether we encourage single occupant vehicles. So if in your city, you know, spend some time, you know, talking to your local representatives to make sure they adopt incentives to encourage the pooling as well as the electrification. So that can mean like if for pooled services, they should not be taxed while single passenger services should be like UberX should be taxed more, much more heavily than Uber pool. That's not happening. And that can be at airports as well as downtowns. We can create curb space that favors the pooled vehicles uh, over the uh, single passenger services. And if you're just a, as a customer, you know, think about using the pooled services for Lyft, with Lyft line, Uber pool. And now there's these micro transit companies like Via and Chariot that run small buses uh, in, in a similar way to Uber and Lyft. Um, patronize those and think about eventually, many of us can give up a car because you've got car sharing available, you know, like Zipcar, you've got Uber and Lyft, you've got Via and Chariot. Uh, heck, we even have share, uh, dockless bikes, dockless skateboards, uh, scooters. So there's a lot more choices. So think about, you know, those are not for everyone, of course, but uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of the scooters, but think about the opportunities to give up a car and use these other services and be part of this uh, revolution. And on a personal note, I as well um, took, took my own actions and went down to a one vehicle household. Um, and I now also have an electric uh, bicycle as our alternative, or we have two electric bicycles as our second alternative vehicle. And so I think it's, you know, we've made a decision to live closer to the downtown area. And, and you know, it took, it actually took a couple of years to get to that point. So really, really good information. And um, I just like to thank you so much. Um, and we'd like to thank all of our viewers for joining us and listening to our Global Sustainability Leader Series. This program will be part of our Global Sustainability Business Associate Certification Program and will be shared on our select social media and broadcast outlets. And thank you again, Dr. Daniel Sperling, once again, for being part of our program and being a global leader in guiding other nations. I know you're, you guide businesses and thought leaders to take the steps necessary in creating a more innovative ways um, to move ourselves and our products. Uh, we, really, we really need more leaders like you who will share your knowledge and with, with others and accelerate that shift towards the more sustainable transportation methods. So thank you. And thank you very much.